Okay. Hello, and welcome to part two of the Healthy Materials series. This six part series is reimagining the definition of healthy materials to recognize all impact categories, including circularity, carbon, water, and equity. Each episode, episode invites speakers from design, policy, slash academia, and environmental justice to share their perspective and offer insights into how we can create a better environment. This series is a collaborative effort between the American Institute of Architects Committee on the Environment in San Francisco, the Carbon Leadership Forum SF and Los Angeles chapters, and the U.S. Green Building Council in LA. In the previous episode, Mallow Hudson set the scene for our discussion and Jack Dinning and Ruchi Shaw introduced frameworks for holistic material health. Today, we will hear from three speakers followed by a panel discussion and Q&A. Please add your questions to the chat box. And if you're interested in learning more or creating working groups, please add your contact info to the Google Sheet that will be dropped in the chat shortly. And now let's get started. Here to discuss healthy materials and structural systems, we're joined by Sandili Mbata, Megan Lewis, and James Kitchen. Dr. Sandili Mbata is a senior manager for research and policy advocacy in the Etiquini municipality, where he supports evidence-based policy development processes through citywide research and strategic planning. He is responsible for driving integrated city-level city data processes for strategic decision-making. As a part of this work, He's establishing strategic partnerships for building an inclusive data ecosystem necessary for supporting a data-driven city. He's also part of the team using a data-centered approach towards SDG institution institutionalization and indicator localization. He is a former director and founder of the Alwatsi NS Research Consulting, an organization focused on human-centric solutions to human settlements, informal land markets, urban planning, local economic development, water, food, and energy issues in urban and peri-urban contexts. He holds a PhD in architecture and town planning from the University of Stuttgart with a focus on informal transactions in low-income housing in South Africa. He has more than a decade of working with the public and non-governmental sector through developing and implementing programs for low-income urban and peri-urban communities. He also has participated in various urban, urban urban development programs aimed at fostering development partnerships between the municipality and communities, particularly conducting research on urban renewal and driving stakeholder coordination and engagement. He also has a vast experience as a consultant across various sectors locally and internationally. He's held numerous, numerous fellowships, which include the 2017-2018 Academy for African Urban Diversity the 2019 International Visitor Leadership Program about, and the MGG Digital Academy Fellow 2021. He has also worked at the University of KwaZulu Natal as a lecturer and has served as an external examiner for postgraduate projects in the built environment and development space. Megan Lewis is a senior researcher at the Carbon Leadership Forum where she leads their research efforts to inform effective and just policies to rapidly reduce embodied carbon across public and private sector construction sectors, including the CLF Embodied Carbon Policy Toolkit and the CLF Embodied Carbon Toolkit for building owners. Previous to joining the CLF, Megan was the head of global energy and sustainability at WeWork, where she also launched the, sustainable ch the Supply Chain Sustainability Program. Megan gained her architecture license while practicing at Thune, where she worked on a range of project types and spearheaded internal efforts to integrate whole building life cycle assessment and low carbon material selection into the design process. James Kitchen joined Mass as an Engineers Without Borders UK Fellow in 2017 and has since led the structural design of the Ellen DeGeneres campus of the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. He has expertise in designing low carbon buildings, seismic engineering, and designing with non-conventional materials. Since James graduated from the University of Sheffield, he has worked, with, worked for AECOM in, in the UK as a structural engineer and project manager, designed schools for UNICEF in Malawi, and volunteered as an engineer in Nepal after the Gorkha earthquake. He is also, chartered, he is also a chartered member of the Institute of Civil Engineers. And now, Sandy Lee, please take the lead.
Thank you, thank you kindly, Brian. Um, if I knew that you want to read everything out, I, I would have uh, saved everyone the pain and <laughs> and write and write only two uh, two sentences. There's nothing to um, to to that long bio. <clears throat> um, I uh, thank you so much, colleagues, and thanks for um, for inviting me, Kathleen, and the colleagues. Um, it's um, I, I was I know I have 15 minutes, so I'll I'll, I'll take the first minute and a half. Um, just as, as, as an introduction, so I'll not reintroduce myself, but maybe uh, just introduce how am I arriving in this, in this space in terms of the presentation itself, but in terms of how I emotionally feeling. I, I watched and listened to Julia and, um, and Alicia's talk, which is a previous talk, and it's, um, it's heart-wrenching and, and infuriating to a very large degree. Um, it also makes me start with the the sort of changes entirely in my, my my presentation um to start by firstly apologizing for working for the state because i think the state is an incompetent institution um it's an institution that is um extremely oppressive in various ways um because it protects the interest of the few but it also um continuously make a lot of mistakes and detaches people from where they supposed to be but i i do work for for Etiquity municipality so I will um, um, I, I will start, but maybe go into the human because I think we can blame the system, but the human um, is 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 a key thing. Um, so as a starting point, sorry, I'm okay. As a starting point, I, I, I my contention is that um, I, I'm, uh, Brian, I may I may just shift a little bit from you know the, the policy the policy speak um, and 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 talk about about some of the sort of critical issues that I think have brought us where we are but I think it starts with human arrogance and that's where that's why we're environmental queen and this this crisis that we find ourselves in um, you read any biblical scripture that talks about um, a dominion over a dominion over uh, any other species. Um, and that for me is, is the beginning of, of that arrogance that we are detached from, from the environment. We are detached from any other species. Um, we are more powerful uh, uh, species, uh, which is completely untrue. And it, of course, then guides us in terms of how we think. Um, you hear people, and I, I hope there's no environmentalist here who always say, who would, would say um, they are protecting the environment. Human beings have no capacity to protect the environment. The environment is too powerful to be protected by human beings, but we're protecting ourselves from the environment because when it pushes back, we've seen with the tsunami, we've seen with many other environmental crises where the, you know, the, the, the environment pushes back. So that arrogance starts to, to come out in policies in the way we do things when we're saying we are protecting the environment, in fact, while we are protecting ourselves. So I, I, the, the question is, is, is then that, you know, do we, do we make these choices? Do material, uh, building materials, are they human choice or contract choice? Um, I, I, I've put in, an, in a very typical format, um, um, put in these African rondovels, you know, which represent African architect, those who've read on anything about uh, Southern African architecture. Um, they are uh, sort of a symbolic of how um, the environment is controlled over a long of, of, of many centuries have controlled our choices of, of materials. So I ask a question to the to the, to the, the um, um, organizers of, 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 of this session uh, of this series as well. Um, is it really about about the human choice? Is it the choice that we make? Um, many of these materials were locally sourced. Um, they were many. They were seasonal, and I grew up in that context. And it's not a context that is a hundred years uh, before my time. It's a context I grew up. And I say seasonal because. For instance, as an example, the cutting of grass for thatching of roofs um, was happening only at a certain time of the year, not throughout the year. So it wasn't, it wasn't like um, a KFC or, 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 or McDonald's that is just produced every time, whether you're hungry or not, you've got to slaughter chickens all the time. Um, and such is the arrogance of humanity, right? Um, but the, some of these building materials were embedded in indigenous sustainability practices. Um, and I could go into detail with that, but I think a lot of you would have read um, about some of these sort of traditional um, uh, architecture and, and, and building materials. And many were entrenched in this symbiotic relationship between the wildlife and humans. So when you cut the, when you cut the grass for thatching, uh, it means the grass will grow. It means other animals will be able to eat. Uh, there will be more grazing land uh, spaces for, for, for animals to come through. But what is, 
what what has changed? What is what has happened over time to get us where we are? Um, so my next argument is this hybridization process. Then it started to happen in the South African context, and this is this is a photo that I took in the peri in what we call the sort of peri-urban communities of Etika municipality. Um, it's a municipality of about four million people, um, about three point nine to be precise. Um, the it, it, we have uh, an urban core, and we have what we call peri-urban. So peri-urban is some of these places that are part of the urban of, of, of the municipality um, have access to some of the urban amenities, but they still pretty much rural in nature, but with a, a twist of urban, if you may. But this is also the beginning of, of crisis. So this adoption of foreign materials. So you can see a corrugated iron uh, roofing on, 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 on these rondovels. And you could see some of them, they're starting to take a very different shape, which is a, a rectangular shape, not the, um, uh, the, the sort of cylind um, uh, cylindrical shape. But we live in a coastal city. So where is the sense in putting a corrugated iron in a, in a, in a, um, in a place that is, um, is prone to corrosion? And um, so this begins those crises. And then there's a crisis of the misalignment between the materials and the climatic conditions. We, in the, in the summertime, we, we, the, the temperatures go up to 35, 36. So it's pretty hot. So you can imagine these are ovens uh, because the insulation is pretty bad between the roof and, 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 um, and the, inter the interior of the house. So the materials begin to be that symbol of the so-called modernization, and I should have put in um, sort of inverted commas. So, so these are communities um, um, sort of playing out this sort of modernized um, uh, living to say we are shifting towards uh, modernization. And there's a lot of conversation we could have about the sort of neo-colonial nature of, 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 why we, of why these communities are starting to, to get there, but what is pushing them? And I'll, 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 I'll talk briefly if I still have a bit of time about, about that as well. So the next uh, situation is the crisis of urbanization and, and dislocation. So urbanization um, is a crisis in itself because it dislocates us completely from our, um, our, our, our sort of traditional environment, but also from the environment itself. So you look at that picture that you already see um, a lot of sort of poverty issues. You should already see that it's 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 not very green. Um, there's few very few trees. It's not really at in touch with the environment. Um, there's this sort of compartmentalization compartmentalization of, of human life that you you it's a working space. So you come to the cities for for uh, economic opportunities, and this is a temporary living space. And then we become very disconnected from nature, from the heritage, from the history itself. And then we become scavengers to our own crisis that we created. So you see tires, you see some of the things that have um, are coming out of this sort of from this industrial process that have been thrown out, and then we are scavenging from these say very same processes that um, we, we, we've, we've created. And these are the sort of very poor communities um, uh, right in the center of this urban life that we is being promoted as 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 as, um, as, a, as a sign of progress. And I have nothing against cities. But I think cities are, are, are very problematic in, in the thinking that uh, human life is homogenous and, and, and reinforcing this sort of homogeneity of, 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 of human life. And I, I know I'm talking to a number of ebonists and it, it, it becomes very sort of controversial to question the very existence of, 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 of ebonism. Um, and I'm not saying there's no, there's no um, uh, sort of positives that have come out of urbanization. Um, over over the past uh, over the past decades and over the past century, but I think there's serious crisis. But how do we then respond, and how does the state respond in a South African context? And I'll bring it closer. There's this neo uh, neo colonization of the building regulation, um, and I call it the great detachment. So the material choice versus context. So the the building regulation starts to say, you know what. There is a choice that we are making as a, as a collective on what building materials we should use. Um, and it's, it, it detaches completely from the context. So you could build a same house. In fact, if I showed you a picture of a, 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 a skyscraper, um, you can't tell whether it's in Dubai, um, whether it's in Durban, whether it's in Lagos, whether it's, it's, it's in New Orleans, uh, whether it's, it's somewhere in Ontario and Canada. Uh, because we are sort of creating this sort of 
um, a, a, a globalization of, of building materials. So this is what's happening. So what you're seeing on the picture is, um, these are the law of, let's call them affordable housing um, for, for low income people in South Africa. And they're very homogenous um, and they are everywhere in the landscape of many of South African cities. Um, and they are a symbol of pride for the state in terms of what the state has been able to produce since 1994. Um, but they are also a symbol of, of a sort of very reckless policy making, very reckless um, legislation around how do you build? Because these houses, I can take the very, exactly the very same house, 40 square meters, uh, same building material and put it somewhere in Johannesburg, which is a bit more colder than Durban, or put it somewhere in Cape Town, which is a bit more windy than, than Durban, or put it in Durban where it's much more humid. And it's exactly the same structure. Um, so there's this sort of homogenization again of human life, and particularly with low-income communities that aren't able um, and aren't able in a um, in a very sort of lose in a lose form because they've demonstrated uh, a lot of low-income communities have demonstrated their ability to make to make material choices way better than the state can make, but it, they they are completely detached from making those kind of choices and those choices are made from the, by the state. Um, the, the the building regulation itself are very detached from context, but they are they are sort of very neo-colonial. I've got my headphones on. I can't hear you. Sorry. All right, um, I, 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 I like this world of visual, of visual, uh, of, 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 of visual meetings. Sometimes you get into a boardroom and start singing and, you know, or, you know, be talking to someone else and um, it, it, yeah, it's quite an interesting space. Um, and, and there's been a, a big issue around the width and the depth aspect, which is the, the numbers game. And the numbers games are everywhere, right? Uh, when we measure human progress and we measure it using GDP, uh, which is completely outdated and, and completely detached from the realities of what how we should be measuring human progress, um, uh, sustainability and so forth. We're saying the GDP of a particular country is X, Y, and Z, while there's people who are living um, uh, 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 in, in absolute poverty because we are doing the, the capitalism completely incorrect. And I don't know whether there's any better way to do capitalism. And in housing space and the building material choices, and that's also been a big problem. So the width versus the depth, depth aspect is that the state, post-1994, the state wanted to deliver as many houses to as many people as possible. Um, and the depth issue was the quality issue, the building material choices that are contextual, that are environmentally friendly, that are sustainable, then became secondary. Um, and I say secondary again with a, with a bit of caution because the question is when when will when will that decision and that conversation around the material choices begin in the South African context? Because every time we talk about low income income housing and delivery of housing, we are talking about numbers. We're talking about backlogs, how many people need access to housing, and so forth. So the numbers game become extremely problematic. Um, so colleagues, I, I I don't have I don't have any. I thought this photo was just uh, fantastic, um, but I don't have any 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 way forward, and that's why I I, I ask a question of where to from here because the, the policy and legislation continues, continues to fail the low-income communities, continues to fail the communities in terms of the choices that are being made. Um, this is a, this house you see inside, and I thought it's a nice play to embedded carbon um, where it's embedded on top of, of another, you know, um, um, sort of um, um, a, 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 another sort of embedded carbon that was put in by the state. So this, what you're seeing inside is a, is a house that's built by the state, um, and but this is a, a household who their income situations have obviously improved, um, and that improvement means they can build a, big, a bigger house. And they, their material choices are already predetermined and predefined for them. Um, then they will build a structure on top of that structure, and before they dismantle that structure, whatever they do with it, but they then build on top, on top, on top, on top of that structure, which is quite fascinating because the state then. Uh, through its regulation and poli uh, its policy and regulation framework, starts to define what kind of materials people um, uh, people are using, and it's not become a, it's not becoming a catalyst uh, for, 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 for 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 change. But colleagues, I want to leave it there. And Brian, thank you so much for the time, and thanks for listening. 
Um, I, I do not, I do not want to bore you with the with the very sort of in depth policy speak, but there's a sort of very fundamental questions um, that I, I need I needed to ask in terms of um, our our own humanity, um, uh, our own elevation of the state, um, uh, despite knowing that the state is completely an incompetent institution, um, unable to protect the poor, unable to protect the environment. Um, what do we do as communities? And part of it is also um, framing it like this was also inspired by what um, what um, Julia May and 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 Alicia um, were talking about, um, and and Kathleen were talking about in the previous conversation. So I, I changed it completely from telling you about about our how good our regulations are, or how detached our regulations are, but to take it to 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 a very sort of different level. Um, so I would like to end then, and thank you so much. Um, uh, for the time, and I'll give it to my colleague. Thanks, bye. Thank you, Cindy. That was, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Megan, go ahead and take the screen. All right, can you see that? Yep. All right, thank you so much. That was a that was a great start, Cindy. Lee. And I, I will apologize in advance. I hope you got enough beautiful photos <laughs> to inspire your imagination. Mine will not include any of those. <laughs> so, um, uh, as I've already been introduced, my name is Megan, and I'm a, uh, a senior researcher at the Carbon Leadership Forum at University of Washington. So uh, I love attending events like this that are hosted by the um, by the Carbon Leadership Forum network, such as the ones in San Francisco and LA. Um, I, I'm based out of the University of Washington, uh, what some people call CLF National. So I like to clarify that uh, events like this. So today I'm going to focus really on answering one question. Uh, what is the relationship between reducing embodied carbon and reducing negative health impacts? Uh, so I'll start with talking about embodied carbon and LCA and then shift to uh, talking about health impacts and then sort of bring them all together. So, uh, so first, um, starting with embodied carbon. Uh, embodied carbon refers to the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the manufacturing, transportation, installation, maintenance, and disposal of building materials, as you can see mapped out here. Sometimes when we talk about embodied carbon, we zoom in on one particular part of the life cycle. Uh, for example, if you're comparing clean manufacturing practices, such as with an environmental product declaration, you might zoom in on the cradle to gate uh, embodied carbon that focuses just on the raw material extraction, transportation, and manufacturing. Uh, I'm not going to focus too much specifically on structural uh, materials today in relation to embodied carbon, but as a reminder as to why these topics are so closely related, uh, I'll start with this graphic that shows uh, the relative contribution of sectors to global greenhouse gas emissions. So when we look at uh, global and use emissions, you can see industry is uh, the largest sector. So iron and steel and cement alone are responsible for 15% of global and use greenhouse gas emissions which is larger than the entire agricultural sector uh, in terms of emissions and over twice the contribution of all of the commercial building energy use in the world. So obviously this is a huge area where we need to focus um, policy and other efforts in order for us to meet our climate goals. If we wanna measure embodied carbon uh, and other environmental impacts, we can use something called life cycle assessment. So LCA is a methodology, we're looking at the inputs and outputs uh, of materials and energy, as you can see labeled here, uh, for all the way through <clears throat> through the different life cycle stages that I touched on briefly before. Um, so some people think of life cycle costing, you know, measuring the financial impacts over uh, over the life of a project. Life cycle assessment is looking at the environmental impacts over the life of a product. The most common one that we measure is global warming potential, uh, which is what when we say embodied carbon we're usually measuring that with kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent or global warming potential. But there are a lot of other uh, metrics that are measured by life cycle assessment for the most popular are here. So uh, acidification potential, eutrophication potential, uh, ozone layer depletion potential and smog formation potential. And I've highlighted smog formation because uh, in addition to global warming, smog formation is the most direct human health impacts. So respiratory issues like bronchitis, asthma, emphysema, and permanent lung damage from prolonged exposure uh, to the emissions that are uh, converted into this ozone uh, equivalent unit. So LCA practitioners, when they do a life cycle assessment, calculate those environmental impacts by looking at the inputs and outputs of those emissions over the life cycle of the material or building. 
uh, and then multiplying them. So multiplying emissions such as methane or carbon dioxide uh, by a characterization factor that converts them into a common unit uh, that we can uh, that we can sort of measure and talk about as a whole. So we don't have to list you know 500 different uh, emissions when we're trying to understand what the in impact of a product is. So you can sort of see um, a summary of what some of those emissions and how they're characterized are on the right here. Some of the impacts are strongly correlated due to the processes that create similar emissions. So one example of that is that global warming potential is heavily correlated with acidification and with smog formation because of the burning of fossil fuels is a big driver for all three categories. So basically, when you you know when you're burning fossil fuels, yes, there's uh, greenhouse gas gas emissions released, but there's also other emissions that are released that are heavily um, that are responsible for acidification and smog formation and some of those other human health impacts. Uh, the range of these environmental impacts varies, which is really important, and particularly when we think about um, what policies and other um, levers that we have to change them, what, how they need to be scaled in order to actually have a change. So we think about local environmental impacts, such as smog formation and nutrification. These are things that can be solved with local policies. So for example, if you restrict the use of fertilizers in agriculture, you can directly uh, have an impact on eutrophication in an area. Um, same with if you restrict emission, oh, air quality emissions from a local manufacturing facility, you can directly uh, decrease some of the smog formation potential uh, because these are sort of local impacts. You know, a, a diesel truck drives on the road, creates pollution, has an immediate environmental health impact uh, on the community that's next to that highway or wherever the truck is driving. Uh, climate policy is a little different. So because climate change is a global impact. So if California passes climate policy, that's obviously a really important step towards reducing global climate change, but it's not enough to eliminate uh, the immediate health impacts from things like wildfires and drought in California, because it's only impacting global, it's only impacting emissions in California and not globally. And because we, uh, because climate change is a global issue, we actually have to have everyone uh, have those policies in order to be able to, um, to you know, reduce the impacts in one specific place. And this tension between the sort of global and local nature of these different health impacts is really important. I'll come back to that uh, when we sort of go to the bringing it all together. So switching gears to talk about um, the health impacts related to the life cycle of building materials. There are two uh, kinds that I'll talk about. So first is the sort of local health impacts. So these are particularly related to facility and transportation emissions. And in addition to CO2, I've added some of the other ones here. So ozone and particulate matter and diesel um, emissions. And then on the right, there, uh, the global health impacts from climate change. And I really want to emphasize both of these disproportionately impact frontline communities. So whether we're talking about um, the local health impacts or we're talking about global health impacts from climate change, these both are uh, disproportionately impacting um, a, number, a number of sensitive communities, which I'll actually talk a little bit more about in a minute. So, Starting from the, this quote from Gina McCarthy, I think captures it really well. Uh, climate change is the most significant public health challenge in the world today. And we can reframe climate solutions as opportunities for investment in public health, which will make our world healthier and more just today while we forge a future we can be proud to hand to our children. Uh, particularly given the length of today's topic, I'm not gonna be able to cover the enormous number of uh, health impacts um, from climate change. And so I really wanted to direct you to work like Gina McCarthy uh, in this book, All We Can Save, which is really amazing and touches on a lot of this because I definitely won't be able to, uh, to cover all of it today. So to name a few of them, um, to name a few of the impacts, exposure to extreme temperature results in heart stroke and death, preterm labor, the altered weather patterns can result in malnutrition from crop failures, uh, decrease in availability of drinkable water, the air quality. Okay, air quality and health issues from wildfires. And, uh, and then a number of other uh, diseases that are more likely in warmer and wetter temperatures also associated with uh, climate. And there's increasing links on behavioral and mental challenges um, that arise from climate change. And we uh, look instead at the sort of the more um, immediate impacts that coming directly from manufacturing and transportation emissions. Uh, there is a huge number of other impacts that are more related to air quality often. So lung and heart problems, asthma, uh, and a number of childhood development issues. 
Um, and again, I'm really only skimming the surface of this because I just want to help people understand how these are related. I highly recommend reading more uh, about these issues. So one of the ways we can understand what the metrics are, so similar to what I talked about what metrics we track with life cycle assessment and to understand embodied carbon, there's a whole other world of metrics that can be used to track um, uh, uh, often by environmental justice initiatives in order to track the uh, environmental health impacts from these same processes. So also from uh, the manufacturing and transportation of the life cycle building materials, as well as other facilities. So California and Washington both have environmental health scoring or mapping, mapping initiatives. So Cal EnviroScreen and the Washington Environmental Health Disparities Map. So this one is from the Washington one, which is uh, very similar to California's. It was built off of that actually. And both of these are expanding the efforts of EPA's um, EJ screen tool. So you can see some of the um, some of the exposures and effects here. And so those are used to calculate a pollution burden. And then there's also population characteristics they look at in order to, um, to calculate so that they can sort of overlay what are the, what is the pollution burden? And then what are the um, things like housing burden, linguistic isolation, poverty, race, transportation exp expense, other socioeconomic factors. Um, and then results in these uh, scores that they use to map what are the, um, essentially the areas that are where the there are the largest environmental health disparities. So this one is for Los Angeles. Um, and this one is for uh, this is the Seattle area using the Washington tool. So um, this one I've specifically filtered for uh, race or ethnicity. Uh, so the darker red being the uh, higher percentage of people of color and blue being uh, wider areas. And then the dots here you can see are uh, toxic or facilities that have toxic releases into the environment uh, and super fun priority sites. So both of these are incredible, you know, both uh, areas where there are toxic emissions, both things like, you know, CO2 or ozone, but also other toxic releases. There's a huge list of chemicals that they track. And you can see that there is a strong correlation between these. And so these mapping efforts are trying to help uh, help policymakers understand those, that connection. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip. Um, to, so, okay, so two things that I just want to highlight um, is the sort of where these, where these things align and then where there's tension between these different kinds of health impacts from the life cycle of building materials. So where there's alignment is on some of the indicators. So there's an overlap or strong correlation between environmental exposure indicators like ozone, for example, is the same indicator for smog formation potential that is tracked with a life cycle assessment. So uh, when you do an LCA in order to calculate embodied carbon, you can also look at some of those other impacts that are direct re di di directly related um, to the pollution burden, for example, that's calculated by environmental justice efforts. But not, not all of these are aligned. So this is not a, you know, these are parallel efforts, not complete overlap. There's also alignment because of the focus on industrial emissions. So um, uh, this, this is looking specifically at greenhouse gas emissions. So as I touched on a little bit, you know, there are a lot of other metrics that are not greenhouse gases that have a really uh, strong environmental health, health impacts, whether it's particulate matter, ozone, you know, lead and other toxic releases. Uh, and so, but there is alignment that both of these are focusing on industrial facilities. And so these pol there's an alignment between the policies that are looking at both of these in that way. But the area where there is tension between these is really when it comes back to the local versus global um, sphere of influence. So when we only focus on local facilities, uh, we can improve local impacts. And, and this is what has been led by a lot of environmental justice efforts which has been incredibly important. Um, so things like the Clean Air Act in the United States, this is really focused on local industrial emissions. Um, but what this can do is outsource emissions. And so, you know, there's a, a, the United States used to have a lot more industrial facilities, a lot more emissions from those facilities. And what can happen is that when it, when we increase environmental policies that are focused just on facilities within our borders, we allow ourselves to outsource those health impacts across borders, whether that you're a state and you're outsourcing that to a neighboring state that doesn't have the same policies or you're outsourcing it to another country. Uh, and we particularly see the limits of that when we think about um, health impacts related to climate change, because if we just outsource carbon emissions across the border, because climate change is a global issue, 
we haven't actually decreased our health risk from climate change at all. Because if we just move those across the border, then we've solved one kind of health impact, but we've left ourselves equally vulnerable to this other kind of health impact from climate change. Uh, and so what uh, the no I'll end on is that hopefully we can just come to policies that are prioritizing both of these. So we can look at, we shouldn't stop looking at industrial uh, facilities that are in our borders, but think about the entire supply chain of products uh, so that we're looking at emissions across the supply chain rather than only something that happens within our city or within our state. And so newer industrial policies like BiClean are starting to look at that and they definitely have a, a far way to go in terms of being able to address these both um, at the same time. Um, and so my takeaways are just, so reducing embodied carbon can directly reduce the risk of health impacts from climate change, and it can indirectly reduce the risk of health impacts from other environmental exposures like smog, diesel emissions, and PM 2.5, because it re uh, focuses on reducing fossil fuel emissions. Building material manufacturing facilities, similar to other industrial facilities and energy generation, are typically adjacent to frontline communities who suffer the most negative public health impacts um, directly from uh, both from climate and from other um, environmental impacts, and that policies targeting industrial emissions do improve local environmental health impacts, but they don't necessarily improve health impacts from climate change. Um, and with that, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and pass it off to our uh, final panelist, James. Thanks, Megan. Go ahead, James. Okay, I hope you can see my screen there. Um, so my name is James. I've, uh, I'm a structural engineer, work for Mass Design Group. I've been based in Rwanda for the last four years, but last month I uh, transitioned to the US to support our team um, here. So I'm in a better time zone for this, for this panel. Um, so at Mass, we believe architecture is never neutral, either hurts or it heals, and we work to promote uh, justice and human dignity. And we're a design collective of architects, engineers, and landscape architects, among other groups. Um, and that allows us to tackle all of these design challenges for, from like different aspects. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that the work I'm presenting is, is not mine alone. Um, and Mass have about 30 built projects now uh, over the last 10 years of our uh, existence. And our first one was Bataro Hospital in uh, Northern Rwanda, um, which finished over 10 years ago now. Um, so here we asked the question, can, building, can a building heal? And this is one of, the, one of two case studies I'll present to give you an idea about how we can start thinking about uh, healthy materials differently. So the healthiest materials are probably the ones that don't exist. So in here, the, this image here, we can, um, we've limited the building services in this hospital to the bare minimum using like natural systems like natural ventilation and daylighting um, to do the job it's always done and also the uh, yeah and then that can also be taken to the reuse of buildings and um, and potentially even asking the question like do you even need a building is, in the, is a building the right solution in in the first place um, at Bataro Hospital, we were like maximizing the use of local labor during the construction rather than using machines. And that came initially maybe from like a practicality point of view, because getting machines like excavators to these remote places was incredibly challenging. <clears throat> and we also were using um, really hyper local materials, such as like this volcanic stone that you can see here. So this is like typically seen as a nuisance for farmers. Um, but it's all over the volcanic north of the country and it's just piled up in uh, the, the corners of fields. So we use like local labor and this local waste product to create the facade of the, the hospital. And even though embodied carbon wasn't a design driver at the time when this project was finished in uh, 2012, we like we think that the natural the use of these natural systems like the local materials and the local manufacturing has contributed to a um, like half the global average of embodied carbon on this project. <clears throat> but the, yes, the building wasn't built with embodied carbon in mind. It was built to maximize the potential of human labor. And this is a quote from Anne-Marie, which uh, sums up what her work means to her. 
And this um, this project actually started a 30 person cooperative for volcanic stone um, facades. And you can see them now all over the country and we're still we're still using them on our project. So on the Ellen DeGeneres campus, the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund, um, that we have the same cooperative working with us like, over 10 years later. So in this respect, we're bringing together the footprint of the building, but also like the human handprint. So that embodied labor, the embodied community that goes into the project and also the embodied culture that makes that building. And we turn this into a, or distilled this into a process we call low fab or locally fabricated construction. And that's a, a process um, that we've put here as four points. So hiring locally means uh, that the jobs and the money go into the community. Sourcing materials regionally uh, supports the businesses and mean, means we're using appropriate forms of construction to the area. Um, investing in training is really like supporting people in the long term and then upholding dignity where the community can create that space that they feel proud of. So I'm now fast forwarding to very recently. This is a project we have under construction at the moment. It's the Rwanda Institute of Conservation and Agriculture. And uh, we'll see healthy materials and the idea of like this low fab again. Uh, on this project, we asked, can um, design improve human, ecological and animal health? So the project is um, a very large campus. It's uh, got 69 unique buildings on 1500 hectares. Um, and it's there to train the new generation of uh, leaders in conservation agriculture. Um, it, all of the power is generated on site and it uh, treats and the water from the lake and then and then treats the wastewater um, as well all on site and it's uh, designed around this concept of one health which originally like the one health concept was a uh, like a to do with um disease transmission between humans and animals but it can really be broadened out into the idea that animals and humans and ecosystems are all uh, intertwined their health is all intertwined and this on the project is demonstrated through the climate sensitive building design, use of natural species in the landscape and integrating integrated water management. Um, and just to touch on embodied carbon again, uh, this project was uh, the embodied carbon or the, the upfront embodied carbon emissions are 40% of the global average for this project. Um, here's just a a diagram to which compares on the left hand side the business as usual case and the uh, RICA project, uh, the RICA standing for the Rwanda Institute of Conservation and Agriculture. Um, and you can see here it's not just one decision on one material that makes the difference, it's a cumulative uh, effect. Um, and lo so low fab construction here is is demonstrated through the fact that 98% of the labor is, is within 100 miles of the site. 96% uh, of materials by weight were from within Rwanda, which is a landlocked country, which is in itself impressive. Um, and there was tra training in formalizing earth and timber construction. And uh, currently we have 1700 workers on site, which is, and it's been like that for about two years now. So I'm gonna talk a bit more specifically about structural materials now. So here we use um, timber roof structure and unfired earth walls, and then stone foundations. I'm not gonna to talk too much about the stone foundations, but I think it's on the whole, it's vital that we're reducing the amount of normally concrete, but just carbon in general that we're putting into the ground. Um, because especially since it's hidden from view and we tend to forget about it in some nice glossy photos afterwards. So the timber, timber is really important on this project. You can see it gives the form of these buildings on the previous photograph, you saw the butterfly roof shape. And in here on the top right, you can see the, the sawtooth um, timber trusses as well. Uh, but we also like exposed all of the structure as much as possible on this project. Um, really just relying on good quality craftsmanship um, to be the architecture. And uh, the roof structure, the timber roof structure, which has steel bracing in it, still came out as 10% uh, uh, of 
the embodied carbon than a um, than a steel the steel equivalent, and that doesn't include any carbon storage in the timber either. But we we didn't just do it for embodied carbon reasons. We also want to support sustainable forests in East Africa. Um, the sustainable forests are or like deforestation is just such a big problem in East Africa and most of Africa in general. And uh, we wanted to demonstrate the benefit of keeping a forest and managing that forest rather than uh, removing it. And, and it, I think even in Kenya about two years ago, they, they banned all logging for 18 months. So you can just, you see how serious the, the uh, issue is. Um, so th we came up with, we did this uh, quick study here, which demonstrated that you can get like an individual, instead of using um, timber or the, the forest for biomass, uh, where they might earn $70 over 20 years, then actually the, if you use that for structural timber, then you would, you would earn more money, but it's just a bit more of a time investment. And originally we were going to source all of the timber, which is 3000 cubic meters um, for this project from Rwanda, from um, an FSC certified mill in country, which we were very excited about. Uh, in the end, we couldn't really rely on that as the sole source of the timber. So we ended up getting, I think just over the majority of our timber from uh, Sour Hill in Tanzania. And because I mentioned that uh, Kenya completely banned uh, logging because their deforestation problem was so severe. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, sorry, South Hill have a cert have, have a growing forest stock, but they're not certified like uh, um, the new forest in Rwanda was. And we also really struggled here with poorly maintained forests. And that led to um, us not achieving the structural timber strength that we were expecting. And initially we, we were rejecting about 75% of the timber that was coming in. But so we had to change, well, we had to work hard to, um, to find the absolute limits we were, we were going to accept. And uh, we, because they don't do machine grading there, then we were visually grading all of the timber and using the best timber in the most highly utilized places. So it was, it was really quite an effort from our, um, our CA teams. And unfortunately, the only suitable treatment um, for timber in, in, in the area is CCA, which is a chrominated copper arsenic. And that's actually banned in the US and Europe because it contains arsenic. Um, it's not common to treat timber in East Africa at all, but do you, there are termites and they will typically cause yeah the timber to fail and but timber is not a typical construction in east africa either um but once the treatment is in the timber it doesn't leach out but it is a but it does mean we have to be careful with providing protection to our workers when they're working with it but also the fact that at the end of life it has to be disposed of properly and it can't be like burnt and the, fu the fumes can't be inhaled Um, and this is a picture from Sow Hill. It, even, even though this is considered a growing forest, a growing stock um, of timber, you can see that the forest techniques are just clear cutting. And actually, that's not that's not ideal practice. So you wouldn't get that with an FSC certified forest. Um, but this isn't this isn't rare. This this happens in the US. Uh, be very more typical maybe with a SFI. Um, sort of certification. So, I mean, we could talk about that again for a long time. Um, and on our smaller projects, we, we work closely with the communities in the forest to, to more selectively choose trees for construction. This is a project in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, where we the project was at just a single school. So we were able to, to selectively go out and choose trees in the nearby rainforest that we could use in the construction. And that means the forest isn't exploited and it can recover quicker. I think mean, it needs to be remembered that the forest isn't, is more than just trees. It ha can offer a lot more too. And a diverse forest can support communities in so many other ways. So the final material I'll just talk about is the earth construction. 
the majority of the walls on the project are made from compressed earth blocks um, with some feature rammed earth walls. And embodied carbon was a huge driver here, um, considering that the walls make up 25% of all of the materials on the project. Um, and so CSEB's compressed stabilized earth blocks uh, coming out at about half that compared to concrete block walls. Um, interestingly, rammed earth not necessarily doing so so well in the embodied carbon front just because of the the large size you need to um to for, for structural purposes and uh, so this is just a example of the supply chain and and it's very short for the earth construction like it's a highly localized process and it's sourced locally and it's sourced uh and then it's manufactured on site but the, and this is also um, an embodied carbon calculation that we did particularly for the uh, compressed earth blocks I'm just uh, showing on the screen there. Um, one of the benefits of sourcing this earth ourselves is that we can decide where it comes from so as well as like choosing the earth based on like the material properties we were also choosing it based on the fact that we wanted to protect environmentally sensitive sites and that was particularly like the wetlands the lake and the forests uh, in this map here. Um, and but we had 2.5 million blocks to make for this site, and we've 60, and that we had 60 people um, making 800 blocks a day using manual presses. Uh, the only external ingredients is a small amount of cement. Um, as, as Sandido said, uh, we often we often like uh, don't appreciate nature's influence in the construction process, but uh, here we it, in Rwanda it rains about or you, there's a rainy season almost half the year and um but we and most people wouldn't make earth blocks in that rainy season but unfortunately due to a, a more commercial construction contract you don't have a choice and uh that, that unfortunately meant we ended up increasing the content of the cement um in the blocks just to deal with the durability of the blocks before they got into the building um more Typical way of thinking about healthy materials is the temperature and the moisture effects. And the, the, I think like the thermal mass and the um, hygroscopic material here means that even in this savanna heat, they're incredibly pleasant places to live and work. Um, but like unfired earth isn't a new technology. In fact, it's like an incredibly old building material and it's still widely used. 90% uh, of Rwandans live in earth buildings. And I think in, I say it's an appropriate technology because I think there's often a trend for us to um, use new and modern technologies rather than necessarily like going back to the tr more traditional technologies that have worked for centuries, millennium. But unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work so well. And this is also a fairly typical site with poorly, with poor earth construction. Um, locally and uh this is yeah just an unfortunate um local house and uh, it collapsed soon after it was built so one of the aspects of this project of Re the rika project was to formalize the earth construction and demonstrate that earth can be used um it, like prop like uh in in formalized construction and um we were actually uh yeah, so until recently, the Rwanda Building Code had actually banned the use of earth construction, even though 90% of people still live in earth homes. Um, so this project demonstrates that the same material and construction method can be uh, used safely. Um, and that led us to being asked to help write uh, specifications and uh, guidance on the use of adobe blocks, which is a, a more traditional mud block for uh, the Rwandan government. Um, and like Sandili was talking about, like that is part of the issue is the use of, um, or it, it was disseminating this information and and having it uh, in um, the standards. Uh, and that's where I'll end. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Those were three fantastic presentations. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we'll start taking them after I run through a couple of the prompts that we have prepared. You can just drop your questions in the chat. We'll make sure we 
uh, capture them. We have about 30 minutes uh, for the panel discussion in Q&A. So let's jump right on in. One of the first things I wanna talk about is uh, this sort of relationship between indigenous materials and processes and uh, what we have today, these more modern sort of complex uh, systems. And I think it would be a good idea to talk about how we got where we are today and use that as sort of a jumping off point to talk about where we can go. So uh, Sandile, let's, I, I'd like to hear from you. We had talked a lot about this, you know, before or rather planning for this event. How, how did we get from using indigenous materials that were local, that were seasonal, um, and, and now where we are today, where we have these materials that are being shipped in that don't necessarily conform to the actual climate or the context? Thanks, thanks, Brian. It's a it's a very it's a very loaded question. And first, maybe let me thank my colleagues, um, uh, Megan and, and and James. Um, I learned a lot about embedded carbon, Megan. Thank you so much for that. And I would like to read more about your presentation and some of the projects in in, in Rwanda are quite interesting. And um, when you show the last picture, uh, James, I might show you a picture of a collapsing mall built out of brick and mortar concrete. So. Um, and that is that is not really a a um, it's just a poor workmanship which could happen either uh, whichever material you're using. I think for me, as as I've said, James, before, it, it's this um, homoge homogenization of of uh, of of building and and life of human life generally. Um, we want to build cities that are similar. We want Los Angeles to be exactly similar to Lagos, which is completely um, um, missing the point. So this whole homogenization that's not only happening at a global scale, but it's also happening at a local scale, where a building regulation is telling people across a city that has very different climatic conditions and context to build in a particular way, um, uh, because it's also about control. Um, and we could say, of course, because the, the, the state often says, and I know I was sanitizing myself by saying the state is incompetent and, and that sort of dismissal of the state in some way. Um, but I think a lot of us know that the state is a system, not the people, but the system itself is quite, quite in, incompetent. Um, but in order to create competency, you, you, you have a, a sort of a centralized view of things and how things should be done. So you then say everyone must build the same way. Uh, everyone must go through the same um, um, uh, building building standards. But part of it is part of the sort of a, a sort of a colonial system. I think in our context to say this is modernization, this is civilization. If you build uh, skyscrapers, if you build up, um, I mean traditional communities did build up uh, to some degree, but using local materials, but there was, now there's a certain way that you need to build in order to, to show that you are moving up. I mean, I live in a 130 year old house, which is a complete colonial house uh, with a, um, it hardly gets cold and this is winter and I have no heating system in this place. And um, this is a Devon winter and we have a fireplace. Um, and the fireplace is just for fun, right? Because the Brits thought, um, we can bring whatever, however we build in Britain and bring it exactly um, it, it, to, to, to South Africa. So I think that part as well is, the, that's why I talk about the neo-colonial uh, process that has somehow find itself into, or uh, find resonance in, in how we develop policy and legislation where we are saying um, we are a homogenous country, we need to build in a certain way, we need to use same uh, materials across board. So I think that's where we're, we're getting it wrong um, uh, sort of, franchising our, our our choices of making of making material choices as communities and saying the state will make those choices and there's no pushback from the side from 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 the from the side of community i mean in other places there's quite a lot of that of that pushback i'm not sure whether brian i'm, I'm answering your question but um i think that for me is, is, is a view in terms of why we've gotten where we are it was a loaded question so a hard one to answer but i think you did a pretty good job <laughs> James, um, I'm gonna push that to you now um, and kind of funneling in there. We have a few questions about the Stone Foundation um, as well as rammed earth uh, in terms of earthquakes. Uh, I will say that um, having living in California and being a designer in California, we have 
done a few projects with Ram to Earth. So I can say that it is safe, but um, James, I'm sure you can talk more to that, um, especially how, how we are looking at that as a indigenous material versus a modern material. Yeah, so I mean, I think to add to the first question, I think that over, over time, like we seem to have lost like the link between craft and building. Like I think that if someone asked me to build a house now, I couldn't build it. Even though I'm a structural engineer and I watch construction all day long, like I couldn't build it still, like I wouldn't know how. And I think with like when people get given Portland cement and steel sheet roofs, they're super easy materials to use. And we don't need to know how to use to build with earth and we don't need to know how to harvest grass anymore and and that and then i think that we got stuck in a cycle of some kind that made it difficult to get out of um but yes and then and then talking about the stone foundations and the ramda uh so ramda is moderately seismic um but not anywhere near california's level and uh ramda is problem material because it's so heavy and uh, with earthquakes the heavier material the more inertia it has so the so that I, I, I don't know in like a very high seismic area how it's dealt with but we did both unreinforced and reinforced rammed earth um we used the new zealand standards for earth construction which we thought were um the best out of the ones we looked at uh but i think it's all about just yeah strong ring beams strong uh, uh, gray beams are always beneficial in those um, aspects. Um, I would say that the stone foundations I, are, then they're, they're nothing fancy, but they're, they're just, they're basically just mortared stone together. So, and then you put a gray beam on top of it. And I know I've looked at, I've looked in the US and you can't do it in high seismic regions, um, which is a shame because it would be a, a huge carbon saver. I mean, it's how we built foundations for forever i mean just rubble stone foundations and the yeah so so i think that would be um would be something that again like could always always be reconsidered in the codes and the standards that are stopping you from exploring these things which i think is the is also a shame megan is there anything you wanted to add And yeah, uh, let's move on to the next question. I, I, I appreciated their answers and I know there's a lot more. <laughs> okay, um, let's let's talk about policy because that's, that's popping up quite a lot. Uh, we received a question here. Um, since climate is a global issue, uh, what do you say to the naysayers out there that like to use the excuse of China and Indi India are not minimizing their emissions, so why should we? Megan, you wanna tackle that one first? Sure. Um, so I think this is, well, okay. So the, the obvious thing to start with is that that is definitely trying to displace blame when the U.S. is also one of the largest contributors to global uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. And so it's not really helpful to move blame around, which I think is the whole, um, the reason I brought it up is because it's not really helpful when we try, when we outsource emissions, because we're sort of all in this together. So the U.S., uh, in other countries, all playing their part is really key to us all um, avoiding the health impacts from climate change, you know, a lot of other impacts, but the focus of today being health impacts. Um, and then second, just building more specifically off of what I was presenting today is that's why we're starting to see uh, looking at product emissions rather than facility emissions uh, as a climate policy solution. That's because um, but because product emissions is looking at the supply chain of the product as a whole, and that doesn't matter what country that is generated in. So, you know, the example, I, I think people tend to think pretty quickly about, oh, China makes a lot of materials. Well, who is buying those materials? United States. So, uh, and many other countries. But um, when we, if we look at the emissions from a product uh, and what the embodied carbon of that product is, uh, and or what the embodied carbon of the entire building is, then uh, we're trying to reduce emissions across borders. Really, no matter where that product is manufactured, when we reduce embodied carbon, we're reducing it um, in all locations, if that makes sense. Let's talk, uh, continuing on policy, um, who are the stakeholders that are missing from the conversation? 
Megan, you can tackle that. And then Cindy, I'd lo love to hear that from your point of view as well. Uh, stakeholders that are missing from, from policy. Well, I, I get personally, so uh, I work a lot on embodied carbon policy and it tends to be um, the, uh, some of the leaders in embodied carbon policy at the state and federal level are the Blue Green, uh, the Blue Green Alliance, for example, and Sierra Club um, that are looking at this, that are approaching this as industrial policies um, and also uh, adding some really interesting labor components to these bills. So uh, the Buy Clean, Buy Fair Washington bill, for example, looks at collecting labor data and facilities in addition to environmental data um, related to embodied carbon. And so, um, uh, so those groups represent you know, environmental and labor. Um, and what I see other conversations that are, um, and why I think the topic of this panel is so interesting is because it's more that there are a whole bunch of parallel policy conversations and there's not a lot of overlap. Um, so there's really amazing efforts led by environmental justice groups um, all over the country in the US uh, at the federal and state level. Um, and because those tend to be local conversations, you know, that are focused around, you know, there's a specific facility um, that is creating emissions or a specific, you know, landfill, like lead, but like these are things that are really happening to people in their homes and they tend to stay local and we don't uh, get to learn from those policy conversations that are happening all over. They stay sort of fragmented. Uh, and so there's some interesting uh, movement now, I think, towards making sure that's a, a national conversation about climate and justice. Uh, and I'm really excited to see where that goes. So I, I think it's not so much, I mean, definitely, I would say that frontline communities are underrepresented in policy conversations. Um, I think their voice is increasing depending on the state, but that the conversations are really fragmented right now. Mm -hmm. Sandile, what do you think? Um, yeah, no, I, I really like uh, Miguel's answer, and it's, it's quite it's, it's quite interesting. Um, the 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 different the, the fragmentation of of these of these conversations is, is 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 I think it's across board, and it happens in in even in South Africa as well. Um, what I what I find more in a in a South African context is is the sort of missing voices of of, of low income communities. Um, not because they're not interested in the issue and there's other issues that are much more pressing, but it's also the, 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 the language that is used, the policy language the, on, on the debates. Uh, sometimes it's, it's very detached to, to their realities and they, they raise issues that are sort of very contextual and somehow because the policy conversations are, are what one, one of the academics calls the, the, you know, the, the, the invented versus the invited spaces. And many of them are invited spaces where they are created by the state um, uh, with a particular purpose of consultation. Um, and, and the invented spaces are usually by environmental groups um, that are pretty well organized. Um, uh, and they have a sort of high level debate on, on these issues. Um, I mean, they do, of course, bring it down to local level, but very often the sort of low income communities do not have, I mean, I don't want to say they have the, they don't have the voice, they don't have the space to voice out um, the, 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 some of the issues on, 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 um, on, on, on building materials and sort of environmental justice um, issues. So I think that for me is the main voice that's missing, but also it's not so much, Brian, about the voices that are missing, but it's also the overwhelming voices um, that are behind the scenes, the lobbyists, the, the big corporations, um, because it's also a balance of the voices that are missing and the voices that are a bit too loud and what resources they put in. I mean, you, you can't, I mean, the photo, uh, Kathleen, you were showing of of Sapref, the, the refinery, the engine refinery, refinery here in Durban and comparing it to Los Angeles, it, it actually does not make sense how that continues over many, many years. And there's proven um, 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 uh, examples and studies to show the, the health impact that the refinery has had in communities, but it continues. But it's because these are big uh, uh, corporations with bigger voices and better voices. But how do you bring the voices to balance? And hence my quest, my 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 my, my insistence on the on the state is being incompetent and protecting uh, certain voices and not other voices because those voices, if they were equal, you could easily show some of the impact. Um, of, of having a refinery next to um, low-income communities and what it does and what and how communities in, in more in sort of more 
uh, affluent areas support what is happening in the refinery because we fill up our, our gas in, in the very same sort of station. I don't want to mention the name of uh, the name of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, the, the, the the, the, the garage, we call them garages and it's the petrol station. So for me, it's the voices that are missing, but it's also the voices that are a bit too loud and uncontrollable. And in the US, of course, you don't need any, there's no better country in the world where lobbyists are more powerful than anywhere else and even more than governments. So. Very well said. Um, we have a question here, from Kathleen. Um, is there a way we can change the global construction industry towards more local craft driven which will lead to economic health carbon benefits etc or is capitalism and neo-colonialism colonialism too strong a force to fight love to hear y'all's opinion james i'd love to hear from you first on this because mass design um but maybe you could talk about the the business structure of mass design because it is so unique for um, a design firm um, in your ability to kind of, you know, pull together all of these pieces and look at local craft versus just the typical traditional materials. Yeah. So, but first of all, Mass is a, a nonprofit as well, which um, allows us to, to be a lot more flexible, I think, with what we and like stay strong to our mission. Um, so that that is, I think, that has huge like benefits as an organization. But we. Um, in terms of like local craft, we also have like a furniture company, right? So like in Rwanda for this Rwanda Institute of Conservation and Agriculture, like somebody needed to make the furniture for it. And the, if, or someone needs to buy the furniture from it for it. And if someone was going to buy the furniture for it, it was probably not going to be from Rwanda, even though Rwanda has like excellent weavers and ceramic makers and woodworkers. Um, but the, they don't, they're not set up at the, they weren't set up to produce en masse, like the high quality furniture that you could get from Turkey or Egypt or somewhere like that. Um, so mass were able to set up to take on that contract and basically uh, seek out the best um, designers and the best uh, craftsmen in the country and, and give them like the sort of platform and the contracts and the money to go and set up these um to, to expand their operations and like link all of these craftsmen together so where you might have just weavers that would make baskets now they can make the backs of chairs for and work with the woodworkers to, to form to make a chair for instance so i think i also showed one of um maybe if i don't if you don't mind me just pulling up the image again because it's a pretty nice image um Give me one second. Yeah, so this, so this is a good example here. So you've got the weavers here mixed with like the certain um, steel workers to make these. These are the backs of sofas, um, or yeah, these are the backs of sofas or couches, and they're, they're, they wouldn't typically be making um, furniture. But I think linking these crafts, craftsmen and craftswomen together is is like leading some to some like excellent results that like. Uh, strengthens the local economy as well. So Rwanda have this, as a landlocked country, they are kind of resource restricted and they have this big push on made in Rwanda, um, which, it, which is like prioritizing manufacturing in Rwanda and items like this and, and construction that doesn't have to use imported goods. Um, so I think that it can be like pushed from the top down in that respect. Um, and I think it can also just be pushed by making, by designers and uh, making educated decisions and, and uh, like knowing their, like the local people that are, that are available to help. And Lee, you wanna? Uh, yeah, can I come oh. in there? I, I, I think, I mean, uh, th thanks, James, for that. I, th I think for me, the, the, the one of the biggest culprits in, in, in sort of changing how we build and changing how we design cities and how we design places where we live um, 
architects are one of those. Um, the 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 no, not not the people, the product of a, 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 an architectural um, a schooling system. Um, if you if you look at uh, architectural curricula, the urban planning curricula, you realize that's where the problem is. We 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 are creating sort of very homogeneous zombies. Um, that um, I, I, I don't mean to insult anyone who's come out through this, that system, but that's what the system is chucking out. It's chucking out people who are not thinking outside of the box and thinking within their context and promoting some of the things that James is talking about. Um, because th these projects, it's possible to do these projects. But a lot of my colleagues that I work with and I talk to, and some of, my, some of them who went to university together, when they talk about um, sort of architectural design and some of the projects they do, um, it's so entrenched in this sort of, again, neo-colonial thinking around what cities should look like, what buildings should look like. And I like the question James was asking, do we even need buildings? Um, and I think it's a very fundamental question. It sounds very philosophical, but we need buildings in the nature that we have been building buildings um, uh, um, on. So I think, I think it's very possible. And you start to talk about dismantling of capitalism. I mean, I, I think it's, it's too strong a system to dismantle because if, if COVID crises have not taught us that we've been doing capitalism wrong. And again, I'm not meaning that there's any right way to do capitalism. There's no other lessons, right? Uh, when you can't, when, when the Germans are, are buying tons and tons of tissue, because they don't know where the next tissue will come from, it means the tissue is made very far. As an example, and people were having list of things to buy so, so that if, if you know, there's lockdown and things can't be shipped, um, then they can't, you know, they at least have something. So it's already telling you that um, we need to go back to sort of human scale uh, economy um, and we can go back to human scale sort of construction industry as well. Um, I can tell you that in this country, a friend of mine was trying to, um, as just an example, a friend of mine was trying to build a thatch house and he had to look far and wide and I think he ended up getting um, a, a thatch specialist, a traditional thatch, thatch specialist from somewhere in Bumalang, which is another province from here because these sort of local skills and artisanal skills have, have, um, have disappeared over time because they've not been prioritized in our education system because again, it's a conveyor belt, right? Um, so someone who come from Harvard, someone who come from MIT, uh, in fact, in fact it's just, um, it, it, it depends on, on your zombification process, you know, how costly it is, how prestigious it is. So if it comes from Oxford, it comes from wherever, it's more a, a, a better uh, zombification process. But it's not, it's not really coming up with sort of groundbreaking stuff that says return to, um, uh, to, uh, to sort of the local way of doing things and the boldness as well of engineers, architects, planners to say, let's go back um, to some of these indigenous systems that exist in North America, exist in Europe, exist in, in Africa, exist in Asia. Um, and lastly, and I know I, I'm, I'm, I'm so passionate about this topic, I end up talking too much. I just wrote, uh, James, that if we start to listen a bit more, uh, the story of termites, that termites will eat the timber, but that's data. So that's nature telling us uh, what is acceptable in that context and what's not. Um, so how do we respond to that data that we get? And I think it goes back uh, to answering your question, Kathleen, that uh, that's when you start to, uh, you use the sort of local knowledge, you use local data that's coming through the environment and nature itself communicating back to what, to what, um, to what you are doing and responding to it. And then our, our response as human beings um, and, and as people in the built environment is to then come up with innovative ways that don't include um, um, embedded carbon and, and, and chemicals that we then start to use. Um, no, thanks. That's uh, a lot to chew on. Um, I, I think that there is so much to, there's so much to, to unpack there. I want to, um, I want to talk about how complex these conversations are, how complex these, the questions are, and really the basis of the Healthy Materials series, which was founded because we realized that, you know, when we use the word healthy, um, when we're talking about building materials, we're really just talking about um, the building occupants typically, but there's all of these other questions around there. There's, you know, there's circularity, there's carbon, there's water, there's equity, the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, from a designer point of view, it's, there's so many, that it's very difficult for us to keep track and it's very difficult for 
um, an organization to decide, you know, what's the first direction that I need to step in or move in. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm hearing today, which is so fantastic, is that um, just by centering sort of people first, uh, you, you can achieve a lot of those, a lot of reductions in those impact categories. Um, but I, I do wanna ask about tools and resources that designers, that manufacturers, that policymakers can, can use to, to think about all of these holistically. Um, Megan, do you have any other tools that you can share with us to, to kind of think about that? Um, well, <clears throat> I'd say it depends on which of the a thousand things that we've talked about today <laughs> that you want tools for. Um, so, I mean, I can recommend, uh, I can put a bunch in the chat in the sort of carbon leadership forum tools. Uh, the, actually, some of the things we've talked about today in terms of um, some of the bio-based material solutions that are, are sort of coming back in some ways in North America, like rammed earth, um, that's an area where we don't have uh, that, that we're a growing interest of the Carbon Leadership Forum in terms of providing resources in addition to the policy resources that we already have, as well as, you know, life cycle assessment and others. Um, so I'd say that uh, the Endeavor Center is another place to look for that. Um, but I would, I would really like to turn it over more to James and Sandile, because I think um, uh, our sort of, we, we try to be a one-stop shop for as much as we can in terms of embodied carbon resources uh, and linking to tools, whether it's whole building LCA tools or, um, procurement tools like the EC3, but I think that I'd really like to hear from them in terms of what tools they would add. Um, <laughs> I guess, so working mostly in Rwanda, no tool has been appropriate for the work there to like, as far as I can tell, like, and I've tested many embodied carbon calculation tools and, and I'm really just talking about embodied carbon calculation tools really. But so I think that's like a big issue we're going to see in Africa in general is going to be the biggest builder in the world by 2060 and have constructed more floor area than the rest of the world already has. So why do those tools and why is this information and what like not available there yet? And I think that that is a challenge. I'm working with the University of Rwanda um, to help start that and, and give like designers guidance on on making these decisions because make, because you don't necessarily need infinite amounts of data to actually start this to, to, to start this process so um like what can we do now and then also what can we uh yeah what what what, what needs to be done to meet the europe and us um, standards that are happening um but i would also and then this isn't a tool but i would i would encourage people to go to like if you're using a building material go to the manufacturers and see how they make it um and then ask the manufacturers where to get the materials from and then go there and if you can take if you can take a couple of days and use it as work um then do it because it's super interesting like i think that getting this opportunity in rwanda to explore the forests and explore the the mills it just opens your eyes to like the amount of complexity that there is even in simple even in what we consider to be simple construction which is like timber um so I think that that would really help people understand like how complex our supply chains are and how complex the issue is. Um, and actually it helps me when I, when we use these more traditional building materials, when they're, they're simpler and they're easier to understand. Um, and they're also more local. So uh, that is not a tool, but it's a recommendation for people to do that. That's a, I want to second that please, please, please go and, you know, learn about the materials that you're, you're using. Ask for an EPD. The more time we ask, the more times, or the, the higher the chance manufacturers are going to learn the need to build the story. Um, I'm going to, James, I want, I want to follow up. And, and you said that the tools that you're, you've been trying to implement in Africa are not really applying. There's two questions that come from that. One was asked in the chat, which is, what are the big gaps in the tools? Like, wh why aren't they matching? And then the second one is, does, does this make you think that we need to have tools that are local or regionalized, or do we need to focus more on international tools? How do we scale our tools, essentially? I think, this, I think the same tool can be used. Like, I think it just needs to be applicable for the job. Like, uh, there's, no, there's no EPDs 
well, it's very few EPDs in Africa, none in Rwanda, for instance, or none, none in East Africa that I know of. I have looked at it quite a lot. So, um, and we're starting to starting to see how we can develop uh, cement um, EPDs, for instance. But like that that EPD might not actually do anything if it exists currently because people might not select different cements based on an EPD. So you need to you can't just approach it by giving people the data. You need to also encourage the demand, which is either from like the political side or it's all, maybe it's from like the, um, the developers' perspective. Um, and so you just need to tag it from every single angle. Um, so it's not necessarily an easy process, but it, we're very fortunate that people like the Carbon Leadership Forum, who I am working with, um, working with Kate in Rwanda, is, uh, are, have done it before and they have like done this for 10 years and um, they've done what works there and we can discuss like an, a, an approach that's more applicable to, well, Rwanda, but then also Sandy, they could do it in, in South Africa, for instance. Fantastic. Okay, we have one minute left. Uh, closing thoughts, Cindy Lay, why don't you take the first step? Uh, you, you caught me off guard, uh, Brian, but thank you so much for, for these conversations. I think they're very useful conversation and we can't exhaust them. Um, there's so many sort of comments and uh, streaming and I wanted to talk to Jill's um, assertion that uh, cities are important and efficient. And I, I think they, they some of the inefficient creatures uh, that we created as humanity, but it's another debate for another day. Uh, but I, I'm really appreciative of, of my, my colleagues and the, the panel um, uh, for, for very in, insightful conversations um, and the lessons that I'm sort of picking out as, as, as we engage. But I think this series is, is, is very important um, and, and somehow I have to find a way to sort of balance between where we are in the global south and where we're in the global north is and in terms of the, these debates and it's important to sort of balance out um, uh, that, that conversation. So I'm grateful for the, for the time and the opportunity to engage and um, uh, thanks colleagues, thanks Brian. Yes. Thank you. Megan? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think one thing and this also gets to the sort of uh, global local thing that, we've, that has come up a lot during this, um, this panel is thinking about Sometimes we can have global strategies that need to be applied different locally. So I think, you know, carbon storing materials, bio-based materials is a strategy that can be applied globally, but that looks really different in different places. You know, there are different agricultural products in different places, different agricultural waste products that we can make into building materials, which we didn't touch on today, but it's another sort of exciting area. And we don't have to hear about a case study and then immediately try to apply it in the exact same way wherever we are. We, we can zoom out a little bit and think about what is this, what is this strategy that's being used? And then what is the strategy relevant to where I am um, that can be applied locally rather than, you know, the example of rammed earth not working as well in areas with high earthquake sensitivity, for example, or uh, high earthquake risk sensitivity. So, um, so just wanted to, to say on that note. Um, and then I think also building off of today's conversation and a lot of the questions, I think that the more um, we can create pathways for uh, in education. I really like Sandile brought up education and how this is sort of the beginning of the of how we um, practice throughout our careers and creating more pathways for uh, and in particular Black, Indigenous, and people of color in, in the U.S. context to to go to education to go to school for architects, planners, policymakers, engineers, and become those um, so that we're having a broader set of perspectives that are coming to these conversations that we're having because that's when we start to get solutions that we aren't thinking about right now um, is when we have more perspectives coming to the conversation. Um, and so, I, yeah, on that note, I'll, I guess I'll pass it off to James. Thanks. Um... I guess I'd maybe try and end it on like asking the question, like who is it healthy for? If you're talking about healthy materials, like who or what is it healthy for? And questioning everything. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and joining this uh, part or episode two of the Healthy Materials series. Thank you to the speakers for these great presentations and this fantastic discussion. Uh, the next episode is I believe June 21st, uh, check out the CLF um, SF Healthy Materials landing page for more information on that. Um, and yeah, thank you all for joining. <laughs>